right. Well, welcome, everybody. Glad to have you all tonight. Good to see you. And um, glory to God. So let's go live. Are we live? Yes, yeah, like we're live. All right. Hey, guys out there in the ether world, uh, welcome to Expedition Church midweek service. We're glad to have you. And um, trust that you'll be blessed and have a wonderful time with us. Amen. And I, I turned the mute button on, but it didn't turn the microphone off or the speaker off. It has now been accomplished. All righty. Let me do one more thing, and then we'll go, we'll go on and get started. Now, send a, there we go. All right. There we go. All right. We've been talking about sharing. Oh, there you go. There's Janie. Yeah, I think Janie gave that so Dick could have. This, yes, you used to have to lay out how you were going to print your reports in these little blocks so you would be able to know where they went. When you, yeah, so that's, that's a um, print chart. Yeah, a, a print chart, which is 100 and, was it 150 character? Positions, 150 positions? Huh? Is it still 130? Okay. What does that say right there on the top? Oh, my glasses. Let's see here. 132? Yeah, I thought it said 150. Okay, yeah. All right. Well, on, yeah. That, what, could the chain printer fit bigger? No, I was thinking Yeah, 132, yeah. But I did, maybe they made a one that printed bigger other than the standard industry. And uh, they thought we better print for 150 just in case. I don't know. All right. Well, how's everybody? Love Jesus? Really love Jesus? All right. Let's hop in here and uh, go, get going. Uh, we are talking about uh, the blessing of God and re re reclaiming it or claiming it for the first time through words. And... Um, we have talked about that the, the gospel is the blessing, amen, and we reclaim it or, or claim it with words. Um, our words uh, will bless us. Our words can bring curses on us, amen. Well, not so be it, but that's the way it is, okay. That may not be an amen, but it's a, that's, that's the truth, okay. And so we talk, we, first we shared on the gospel refers to the blessing um, and that we are, to, we are to employ our divine apparatus, which is what? Our mouth. That's right. Your mouth is your divine apparatus for uh, claiming things from God. Hallelujah. And um, then we wanted to go ahead and look into God released the blessing um, to, um, through words. He released the initial blessing through words. Go to Genesis 1. That's pretty far back. I don't know if y'all realize that or not. Okay. What did God say in the beginning? Genesis 1, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And so God blessed them. All right. And everything God did here, he used words to do in Genesis in, uh, in Genesis chapter 1, he used words to accomplish all of these things. And he said he blessed them. God, what? Spoke it. And he said be, he blessed them, saying. Notice that I said he blessed them, saying. So we have a principle established here in the very beginning of recorded biblical history um, that God blessed through saying. Okay? And so... Words were used to bring the blessing into the earth. We, appro we appropriate that through. Words were used to bring it into the earth. We appropriate what was brought into the earth through. Divine apparatus, which is your. And we do, and we, we do what? We say, all right? We say it. Um, 
Genesis 2, 3. Again, here in the beginning. And God blessed um, the seventh day and sanctified it because that it had rested from all the work of his hands. Amen? All right? Uh, I, I, I did skip over verse 28 of the previous chapter. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon it. Now, now here's so God brings the blessing. God establishes man's position of authority with what? What did God establish man's authority with? His mouth, with words. Okay? He said, be, he said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion. So here we're, we're getting something established in God's relation with creation that words have authority words create dominion words appropriate words are creative they have creative power amen he, he, he upholds all things in the universe by what the word of his power by his what the word so we don't you know these things are all in place by his word the universe, I, I just, I get amazed at the, the, the atheistic, secular humanist, um, super um, intelligentsia, supposedly, of, of humanity that they don't believe in, in, in a creator. They don't believe in, in a divine uh, creation, that this thing happened, this entire universe happen by chance there was a cosmic explosion and it threw all the stars and planets and all the gases into the universe and they spun around for a billion years and they ultimately formed planetary uh, bodies and so suns were created all the stars out there you see are suns okay they're suns they got their own little solar system and stuff all right Everything is on a precise timetable. We, they, you, you go to any astrologist, not, uh, astronomer, <laughs> not an astrologist, don't go to one of them. <laughs> you got to cast the devil out of them. You okay. go to any astronomer, and they can tell you when Halley's Comet's coming back by. To the second. Isn't that amazing? They already know when it's coming back by. And it's got an orbit out there. And, and I don't know if they can actually see its entire orbit because it's wherever it travels, you know, and how many ever years it takes for it to get back around here. But it will arrive on time. Okay? The, the, the it, tilting of the Earth's axis is precise. The amount of time it takes for it to rotate is precise. The amount of days it takes to rotate around the sun is precise. Exactly precise. All right? It's out there. We're just flo floating around the sun. The moon's gravitational pull on the earth to create tides is exactly precise. You go to Myrtle Beach and go pick up one of the magazines, look in there to the tide chart, and they got every day for the next ever how long at certain beaches, specific deep beaches. North Myrtle's high tide might be 20, 30, 45 minutes different than Surfside's, and they're only 30 miles apart. They know precisely when it's going to happen. This, that does not happen by chance. That, that, that preciseness and that exactness cannot happen by chance. As a matter of fact, if you probably went and took a bunch of real scientists, not grant money-grubbing scientists, what do you mean by that? They get a grant, they tr they'll prove anything for the right money. They'll, they'll, they'll live, make an entire living off of studying, you know, cow flatulence, which they are now trying to start eliminating cows because they're called creating global warming. Ireland is about to kill 200,000 cows in Ireland in order to reduce 
their gas, their, their greenhouse gases, um, and their effect on cli the climate to meet the European or the Paris Accord goals. They, we, we just signed a pact to start doing some of the same things. Mr. John Kerry, the um, um, climate czar, who zooms around in his jet putting out more flatulence uh, gases than the cows are, as he flies all over the world in his private jet, you know, saying, we got to do this, we got to do this. So what do they want to do? They want to grow laboratory meat. They want to grow your steaks in a laboratory. Oh, you ready for this one? Using cow cancer cells. They want to use those cells to grow the meat in a laboratory because it's more environmental friendly. No, the big people out there have their hands in something and they're making filthy rich off of it by having us eating solute green. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go look at the movie with Charlton Heston in it. Soylent green. Isn't that right? Soylent? Yeah. Soylent. Okay. Soylent green. All right. I saw it as a kid. I just, you know, the, the green chips reconstituted hu dead humans. It was the food supply. All right. But anyway, take and say, we want to create a universe. No, we, we believe that a universe can just happen. And all these things be this precise. They would, they would say it can't be done. Without, without any human intervention, without any intervention, it just is going to happen. Now, they've gone back and theorized that that is what happened and everything. And, um, and the reason they did that is because they have been able to determine that the entire universe started from a single point and is expanding in every direction at the speed of light. So they call it the Big Bang. I guess in one sense they're right. The bang was God saying, light be. Why is it still expanding in every direction at the speed of light? Because he never told it to stop. It's still obeying him. Exponentially, I might add. Amen? So, these words, words have power. He created it with words. It's being upheld by the power of his words. So, and, and, and when created man, I think the uh, King James says, and he breathed in him the breath of life and he became a living soul. But that Hebrew uh, phrase literally says he became a speaking spirit. He became a speaking spirit. See, God created man in his class after his kind. Now, other animals can't talk <laughs> other than a parakeet. I mean, he can mimic. But we, we speak and say words to a parakeet. It's probably just me. He just got it. He's just repeating the, the sounds. Okay. But, you know, the rest of, the, you know, your dog barks and wags its tail and looks at you with the eyes and you figure out what they want, especially beagles, hound dogs, any hound dog. Okay. They can use them eyeballs to get anything they want. All right. But God created man in his class after his kind, after his likeness. And God does things by words. He created man to have all of that by words. So he places the blessing into the earth. Blessed. And we go and get it by words. Not by a third job. And that's, I'm not against hard work. We, we, I'm not against hard work, am I, Daniel? No. You know, Jerry's not against hard work, are you, Jerry? No. Um, you know, we're not against hard work. But there are things you're going to appropriate if you want it to be the blessing of the Lord. It's going to have to be done through speaking the right things and appropriating through your words. Amen. Okay. Your words are important. Your words are valuable. Your words institute things. Don't think that by your hand you've gotten this. You know, I don't believe in self-made men. Because there's a piper to pay when you do it all by yourself. 
somewhere in there, there's going to be some ugly skeleton get out of your closet, and you're going to be in trouble. Somebody say, oh, me, or help me, Jesus. I don't care which one. Oh, me. Yeah, okay. all right. So um, the blessing was released by words. And let's look over Genesis 12. Genesis 12, looking into the first verse, we'll read verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord God said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, and unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make, listen, now what is God doing? He is conferring a blessing, how? With what? And I, listen, and the Lord had said, had said unto Abram, he spoke to him, get thee out of thy country from the father, kindred from thy father's house unto land I will show thee. I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessed thee. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families uh, of the earth be blessed. So Abraham, Abram, I keep wanting to call him Abraham. We know he becomes Abraham. Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. 75. I'm going to tell you something. Living in Hungry Jack instant potato era, are you here? Listen, you don't have to do that anymore. You go to the freezer section, and they've got frozen mashed potatoes. All you got to do is go home and pop them in the microwave or into the oven for whatever time, and voila, no peeling, no boiling, no mashing, no adding the salt, the pepper, the butter, none of that. And there you go. Instant satisfaction. The problem is, if you were to take your frozen mashed potatoes and put them up beside somebody's homemade peeled, buttered, or peeled, boiled, drained, mashed up, how many have, have a potato masher? Okay, yeah, you know, just you go all around, mashing them up. Okay, throw your butter in there, throw you, put your salt and pepper in there, get out the heavy whipping cream. Oh, yeah. I mean, some people like to put a little sour cream in them for a little different flavor, but, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's kind of cool if you're doing like a little fancier mashed potato, but let's just leave it as it is. <laughs> okay? Whip that cream up in there. I mean, ooh, I can guarantee you put that next to your frozen ones, and you're going to be going... Uh, they lied, they lied, they lied. Plus, it was half the price of the frozen ones. Okay? Just took some more time. And we've been trained, we've been trained to do everything instant. Do it quick. Do it conveniently. Okay? I don't know about you, I get tired of going to restaurants. We get, we get busy sometimes, it's like, I don't want to see the inside of another restaurant. I don't care. I don't care what it is. Maybe Ruth's Chris, I wouldn't have gotten tired of, because I do that so rarely. We do that so rarely. I mean, it's not a, it's not even, it's not a four, five, six time a year thing. It might be once or twice a year. You know, we make it really special. It's fun. It's nice. And they do have good steaks. Anyway, they do have good steaks. But they, but see, now they, they they've done. They cooked. They cooked it. They seared it. It's all been prepared. Okay. I just I paid them to do the work. They have lobster tail. Mm -hmm. And it don't smell like Clorox. <laughs> How many have ever been in there, you know, and the lobster comes out and you, it smells like chlorine? You know, that's, that's cheap lobster tail. They, however, they preserved it while they were trying to get it to the table. And I know red lobster supposedly, you know, it's right there alive and they're going to grab it out because it's, it's, it's clawed or, or taped up and all that stuff. Okay. But I ain't sure. That might be for show. Okay? Now, where was I with that? Oh! 
this training of an entire generation, maybe even longer, of everything convenient interferes with the process of waiting for good things. Okay? There's a process. Abraham, or Abram, was 75 when the Lord spoke to him. 75. He had lived 74 years plus, and God hadn't spoke to him. That's a long time. Now, this was not made up for today. This was already on the docket a couple, three weeks ago. Okay? I just want you to know that. All right. Uh, this is already, the notes were already done. Okay. Um, so he was 75 when God found it. And then he didn't tell him everything. But what did he tell him? I'm going to bless you. All nations will be blessed out of you. He didn't tell him how. He just spoke it over him. And set into motion things that were going to create a series of events in the process of leading and guiding him into that place God called him to be. 75. 24 years later, his name was changed to Abraham. Now, God told him. Listen, now, when he's 87, um, he, he, his wife, not being a good wife, she wasn't bearing children. So 12 years, so he's 80, 85, 87. Sarah, or Sarai at the time, is 10 years younger than him, so she is um, 77. And then she goes and says, well, seeing that the Lord hath withholden me from having children, why don't you go into my, unto my handmaiden, Hagar, it may be that she bare children. Now, they, they had kind of a belief that, you know, she could give her handmaiden and it would be her child. Although the hand, kind of like a surrogate mom, okay, but not with the test tube. Got it? I mean, it was the night in the tent thing. And Abraham said, no, baby, I can't do that. I love you too much to, to violate our covenant relationship. I just can't do it, baby. He, you know, that ain't what happened. You know what the Bible says? He hearkened into the voice of his wife, Sarah. Okay? <laughs> like, yeah. Woo! When were you going to get around to that? Now, I know how it is today. Woman offered her husband that. He'd be dead the next day. It was a test. It's a test. Don't fail the test. Don't ever fail that test. Because you'll get this, you'll get, now Sarah didn't kill him, but as soon as that baby's born, she despises her handmaiden, Hagar, and, and runs her off. And God comes back and says, no, you go back, you know, all right, my, hand, you know, my master's dealt harshly with me. And he, he sends her back. <clears throat> God comes to talk to Abraham again. And he says, Abraham says, oh, that uh, Ishmael might live before thee. Right? He said, I'll bless him because you asked me to. But this is not the promise. That is not the plan I was talking about. Now, we've paid the price for that whole thing. You know, if you go back and listen to old um, British terminology around the wars, they refer to the Muslims as Ishmaelites. They didn't call them, they didn't call them Muslims, they called them Ishmaelites. Pretty accurate. <laughs> okay? And so, another 12 years goes by. And when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared unto him and said, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Amen? And then he goes on and says, you know, talk about blessing him and so forth. And uh, Abram's like, you know, wow, I'm 99. And he, the Lord says, this time next year, now, let, let's stop here for a second. This is a good place to put this in. Um, 
God appears to Abram at 75 and gives this grandiose promise. Okay? Grandiose, I mean, the whole earth is going to be blessed by you. That's pretty big. So what's Abram thinking? Just like all of you are thinking. Next week, man, we're going to have us a, a spiritual party. I mean, when the Lord put it in my heart, I'd be going to the, the Orient to preach. I'm thinking next week I'm packed up and I'm out of here. I really did. I honestly thought it was just a matter of months at the most I'd be in the Orient as a missionary. And all I can say is thank God I wasn't. Because I would have, I would have blown up. I would have spiritually blown up. Wouldn't have had a clue what I was doing. Amen? And there was a process after that. So Abram gets told this at 75. About 13, 12, 13 years later, Sarah's figure, this thing ain't working. We got to do something to help the Lord out. Right? We got to have a seed. Remember that the Lord, Abram said to the Lord, said, what will you do for me seeing I go childless and this Ele Eleazar, my steward's son, is my heir? Right? He's thinking, well, you know, we got, we got to have an heir here. <laughs> I ain't getting no younger. Since when does that mean anything? See, science tells you this, and science tells you that, but God's bigger than science. And so, you know, he gets up to 99. Now, we're 24 years down the road, and Abram has been Abram, has been Abram, has been Abram. With this one major promise when he was 75. Like one guy used to, uh, uh, one of my Bible school teachers, uh, he's, he's, he's his own pastor now, so years and years ago. But he, he called him Granite Head Abraham. Okay? Because he was always doing something stupid in that 24 year period. All right? All of a sudden, after 24 years, God shows up and goes, this time next year. Wow, well, could, why didn't you just tell me it's going to be 24 years? Because you had to learn, Abraham had to learn things. He had to learn to trust God. He had to learn that you can't do it man's way. You had to learn that man's way is not going to make it happen. It's not, you're not, God's not going to change his plan because you want to do it a certain way. God's not going to change his timetable because you want it on a certain timetable. I wanted our own building 35 years ago. Hello? Well, 36 now, but uh, when we got in this building, it 35 years. Question, are you really called? If you've been called, you had your own place by now. Oh, yeah. Others have come, and others have gotten big. Others have gained notoriety. Okay? Others this, others that. And I had to go back to one thing. You know what I had to go back to? What? When you're questioning things and you're not sure and you're frustrated, what do you do? You go back to the point that you know God spoke. God put something in your heart and you rest there and he, until he redirects it. Okay? You want to sk skip over years not really, you're kind of floundering when he spoke here and you're trying to look here and look there and look here and look there. Um, I'll come back to that. Let's take a side journey off of that. See, I've seen ministers, you know, they are on the highway to success. They use all the world's techniques. They connect Wherever they are in their ministry, they connect with a more visible 
higher octane, more well-known than themselves. Okay? And when that gains them a certain level, then what do they do? And listen, I'm not talking about uh, hypothetical. I'm talking about people who've done it and have been told to my face that that's what they did by people who were uh, in their inner circle. Now, they didn't put it in the, in the strip off all the glory and strip off all the fluff and puff and all the, you know, eat up ba ba off of it like I'm doing right here. Here they go. I outgrew them. Why? Because they connected with a more nationally known minister, with a bigger star power, with a bigger drawing card, so they can milk that in getting them to where they want to be. It may not be where the Lord wants them to be. See, in the church, we've got this idea that if you don't have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 people, you're not successful in ministry. Well, let's go tell um, Philip that. Because Philip had a citywide revival going on. Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ. People giving heed to him, both hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Inasmuch as Lane Walt, the blind saw, you know, he goes on and talks about all that. When the disciples at Jerusalem heard that, um, they, that Philippi, I mean not Philippi, Samaria, uh, Samaria had received the word of God, they stood under them Peter and John, who when they were come down, they might lay their hands on them, that they might be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now what happened to Philip? What happened to him? He leaves the citywide revival. He started in the hands of Peter and John. Because he was led by the Spirit. He goes down uh, somewhere and encounters an Ethiopian, okay, uh, proselyte Jew. And the Spirit bade him to go join himself to him. He went and got on the chariot and saw he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. And... Um, and he asked, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm reading this. He said, tell me, sir, do you know of whom he's talking? In that place, he began to open up and share the scriptures about Jesus being the Christ. And they got to a certain point, they found water. And the Ethiopian turned to Philip and said, um, what, what prevents me from being baptized? He said, well, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, I do. They went into the warm baptized. And when they came up, Philip was called away. The Ethiopian just went his way rejoicing. Probably going, that was cool. <laughs> this guy shows up out of nowhere, shows me the truth. I get baptized. He disappears. And he was found 30 miles away. Okay? And Azotus, or Azotus, or however. And he preached all the cities until they came to Caesarea. He got the first translocation ride yeah. of the church. Scotty got beat out by Philip. You know, and, and Philip won't, uh, the, when the, the, the angel wasn't going, I'm, he, he's breaking up, he's breaking up, Captain. Okay? How do we measure leaving a city-wide revival? People are getting saved. People all over, I mean, they're, they're, they're throwing out their enchantments. They're, I mean, they are just having <coughs> this revival. The big guys show up, and he turns it over to them and goes and gets one guy saved. Was he successful? Absolutely. As successful as anybody there ever was. He didn't have the numbers. So you can't look at things the way the world sees it. You cannot measure your spiritual strength and success by the way the world measures success. The measure of your success starts first and foremost with obedience to God and doing what God said to do. Hello? Now, let's back up here now. I numerous times was encouraged to leave Greensboro. Friends, 
I had a minister friend that I loved dearly. If that happened to me, what's happened to you in that city, I'd have been gone. I'd have gone somewhere else to find somebody else. Yeah, there's only one problem with that. The one that called me didn't tell me to leave. Yeah, but you're not having success. So-and-so's moved into town, and you've lost people over there. Somebody else came to town and lost people over there. And they come to you and say, oh, Pastor Ed, we, you go to a meeting somewhere, they show up. We just love you. We love your church, but we're supposed to be over here. Okay. Not sure how everybody's supposed to be over there with somebody else, and none of them's supposed to stay with us. Don't know how that works. So you struggle with that because the world says this, that they're successful because they've got all the right stuff in place or, or all the zoos and wham whams or the, all the glitz, the glitter, all this, all that, and you don't have it, and they're all going over there. You come to a place in walking with the Lord and maturing that you begin to understand it doesn't matter what someone else is doing. It doesn't matter how big they are. It doesn't matter how many people just, uh, you know, ooh and goo all over them. Are you, remember, remember this? But guys, I am talking completely out of my heart. I'm, th them ain't even there. <laughs> remember when they were sitting around and, they were talk and Jesus was talking to them? And um, he, he looks at Peter and says, Simon Jonas, lovest thou me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love thee. He says to him again, Simon, do you love me? He said, you know I love you, Lord. Then feed my sheep. The third time he asked him, Simon, do you love me? Okay. And uh, he said, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. And then finally, the Lord asked him again, says, do you love me? And he's like, you know I love you. Why do you keep asking me? Amen. And then the Lord tells him he's going to stretch forth his hands, you know, and he, he tells him basically how he's going to die. Well, Peter's like going, well, what about him? John. Let's talk about John. What about him? And um, here, King Jimmy, that, it's just so flowery. Uh, you know, it's all flowery, poetic. It's such a flow. You know, what about him? Because Peter's seeing himself to Jesus. Back up. You were, you were there. You were there. Lord, and what shall this man do? Like, Because you just told me I'm going to get crucified. And he's over there leaning all up against you, the disciple that Jesus loved. I mean, you know, he's the, he's the cat's meow of the ministry team. And the Lord says this to him. He said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is it to you? Follow thou me. Okay? In other words, can I take out the King Jimmy? It's none of your doggone business. You do what I told you to do. Don't measure your ministry and your success and your calling and your destiny against his. If I want him to stay until I come back again, that doesn't mean anything to you. Everybody say, wow. All right. Now, there it goes, the Bible goes on and says this, but I knew people I went to Bible school with. They were some of the flaky ones. They're the ones that slipped through the application process and should have never been there. Okay. But they made it through somehow, some way. A couple of cooks are crooks, I think. All right? John's still alive. I got a revelation. John is still alive. And they read that scripture. They just forget to read the one after it. You know? If I will that he stay here till I come back, what is that to you? See, Jesus has got John somewhere on the planet still alive. You're like, the next verse, guys. <laughs> then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. 
Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? He was using it as a, a, an allegorical comment to make a statement, make a point. If I want him to stay here until I get back and you will be crucified in, you know, in two years, big whoopee. You do what I told you to do. Oh, yeah. I got a revelation. Your revelation would have been burst by the next verse. They get big eyes. And they go like Ka in Jungle Book. Trust in me. Trust in me. Mm, eyeballs pulling in. <laughs> Hypnotizing them. All right? So, <clears throat> here, you know, let's, let's back this up. Abram's told to go do something at 75. It's 24 years. And after 24 years, God gives a very specific statement. This time next year. This time next year. And he had already told him, it was not, you know, it was not going to be Ishmael. Out of Sarah, Sarah will give birth. She's over here in this conversation and she laughs sarcastically. My mother in law used to do that all the time. She bloped and give a sarcastic laugh. You'd say something, she. <laughs> and my father in law would do stuff to get her stirred up. And she sit over there, and she wait, and she think, and she'd wait, and she think, and all of a sudden she goes, "Well, I, yeah, 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 yeah," and then start arguing her point, and then she, and then she goes, "Huh?" And he's over there with that cat grin on, looking at us, laughing because he got under her skin. <clears throat> I think Frankie Valley song, "I got you under my skin again," <laughs> was his theme song. <laughs> <clears throat> so now let's bring this, let's, let's, let's go forward. We come along and we'll read certain things in the Bible. And we think they're, they happen in a week's time. You know, you got stuff in the Bible. <clears throat> Paul goes like 12 years. He goes out to the back of the desert. Was it three or 12? Paul went out after <clears throat> Excuse me. After Paul was converted, he went off and wasn't heard for for a number of years. Okay. Paul traveled around as a, as a you know traveling minister with Barnabas. Paul wasn't the leader of the team, but Barnabas was the team leader until Acts thirteen. As they ministered unto the Lord and fasted and prayed, the Holy Ghost said, "Separate unto me Barnabas and Paul for the work whereunto I have called them." And at that point, Saul's name was changed to Paul. Up until that point, until Acts 13, 1, he was Saul. Then he became Paul. So, and, and, this, and this is one of the things I dealt with early in ministry, very early in ministry. And, and dealt with for a number of years. Because I went to Bible school with people. They walked out of Raymond and already had a church waiting for them. And they were no more ready to pastor, hello, than I am to go down to uh, um, Cape Kennedy or uh, Cape Canaveral, back, it's been changed back to Cape Canaveral, at the Kennedy Space Center and put on a suit and take off and go into space tomorrow. All right. Matter of fact, one of the people I'm talking about, um, they went out, had a church, go marry a, a guy's daughter. And he kind of, he called himself like an apostle, had a church there in, out in um, Oklahoma. And for a wedding present, basically, he gave them the church. He blew it up in two years. Blew it up. Hello? Wouldn't listen to correction. I talked with Buddy. Buddy Harrison, because we were both, you know, we were ordained with SCF. Rhema didn't exist at the time. RMAI, Rhema did, but RMAI 
the minister's association, they didn't ordain. That wasn't an option when I graduated. Okay. He was with FCF. I was FCF. And um, he said he called me. That's what he said. He said he called me. And I told him, anything with more, more than one head's a freak. He got into this thing called plurality of eldership. It was, a, it was an Australian doctrine that came out into Oregon on the West Coast, West Washington and Oregon, and uh, it, it messed up churches. Because, you see, the set one was the leader. But they were all equal, co-equals. But the head of that local church might be the pastor. Probably not, because it could be the apostle, could be the prophet, could be the evangelist, could be the teacher. Because you need to have all five gifts in your local church. And among those leaders was a set one. Let's have the prophet in charge of the local church. Hello? Especially people who don't know their head from a hole in the ground about being led by the Spirit. I'm, I'm going in so many different directions here, but I'm trying to keep it tied. There was a teaching, Brother Bill remembers, called Motivational Gifts back in the 70s. Well, new ministry kind of was the head springboard for this teaching. And, you know, they went to the, in the Bible where it talks about, you know, if you, you give liberality, if you prophesy, da, 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 da. And they came up with this terminology that is not a biblical term, but it made psychological sense, called motivational gifts. And one of them was, being, was prophecy motivated. And they would, go, they would basically give you a worldly, secular, psychological analysis of your personality because you were prophecy motivated. They're black and white. They tell it like it is. Da, 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 da. All that did was free people to go be arrogant, snotty, in your face and go, I can't help it. I'm prophecy motivated. I don't care what you're motivated. You're still supposed to walk in love. And you're to love the church like Christ loved it and gave himself for it. Hello. No, I'm prophecy motivated. I can be a jerk. And they Anything? I don't receive anything you got to say. I ain't going to receive a word you got to say. Because it's not coming out of the Spirit. It's coming out of your flesh. That's your prophecy motivated. And it basically was nothing more than a, than a uh, personality test. And then they would say, you're prophecy motivated. Amen. And so they wouldn't have all these people in the church running the whole local church and all that kind of stuff. Let me, get, let me go back and hook into where I was going with that. The gifts, you know. Where I, oh, anyway, so he got into that. That's right. That's why I got over there. He got into that teaching and started trying to do it. I went to see him. The year after I graduated, I went down to where he was. to uh, We were going to visit because he'd been my roommate. And he was down in southern Oklahoma. So he had to go past Tulsa, past Oklahoma City, and go down to the border of near Texas. Okay? And I, we'd driven 27 and a half hours without being stopping in the hotel. We would, I, had a, I had a demon car. I had a AMC Gremlin. Okay? And we would climb into the back, take turns climbing in the back, and getting some sleep back in there. I took back over after going through the mountains. Jamie had never driven in the mountains. And I'm laying in the back of that car, and I'm going, brr, 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 brr. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm following that truck down the mountain because he's so tired, so he can't see. Pull over! I'll drive him. You know? I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm going through the gauntlet at a football practice. You know, they all got the, they got the, the body dummies, you know, and as you go through, they bang you from each side. They keep hitting you with them. You ever done that? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah get hit with the, you know, getting, I mean, just hit you as hard as they can. Because if you're, if, you're if you're holding the dummy, you want to knock the snot out of that guy. It's just fun. Anyway, and so we had driven 27 and a half hours. We were going to stay with them, get there to the house. And um, he wants me to go to the church with him. I mean, here I am. Okay, 
<laughs> Go and sit down in his office. He looks over and says, how are you, Elder Taylor? <laughs> I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. And he does this like 10 or 15 minute elder thing. Yes. You know, because the Bible talks about elders, but the elders are, see, you've you got to understand things. <clears throat> they refer to the early leaders in the church as elders because they were older. They weren't raised up as pastors and stuff yet. They were young, all young in the Lord, but older people. So they took older people and had them overseas just because of natural wisdom of living. Okay? They had some sense about them. Elder Taylor, Elder Taylor. How are you doing, Elder Taylor? I'm like, that gum tired. Not really up to this elder inquisition. Gives me this book. Church government in the New Testament by Kevin J. Connor. I'm supposed to read this because it answers all my questions. I didn't have any questions until you started calling me elder. I was perfectly fine. So I preached for him there and then, you know, that Sunday, and then we drove up to Tulsa, back up to Tulsa, and um, went to Alumni Week. Whew. I didn't get called elder at Alumni Week. Brother Hagen's ministering, uh, that Alumni Week, um, T.L. Osborne. <laughs> wow. Say wow. Say it backwards. Love T.L. Osborne. He loved people. I loved him. Amen. And so we go back to our, our, our hometown. I'm down there. I'm, you know, if we come back to Alumni Week or something, we run into people. I'm pastoring. I'm traveling. And, you know, and, and what are you doing? I'm frying chicken. And I'm in the ministry of helps in my local church. It's like you got the plague. Look what I've done in the year and a half that we've been out of school. Look what you're doing. You're, you're a chicken frying ministry of, minister of helps. Wow. You so low. No success. Success is not written over your door, doorpost. Because all you're doing is working a job so you can work in your church and be a blessing. You're nothing. That's the attitude. That's what you get back. So it gets to the point you don't even want to go to the meetings. That will be a benefit to you. Because of the shame. Okay? You're just ashamed. You're a failure. Because here's this person, and they're just rising to the stars. Except they blow the churches out of water and end up divorced. So what happened to this guy. Tore the church all up. No, I think there's more to the story there. Tore that church up. Moved back to the same town that we were all from. With his wife, who daddy gave him the church to, that he destroyed. He had 83 people. He got a church of 83 people handed to him on a platter. And it took him less than two years to blow it out of the water. And he went to Buddy about this doctor. Anybody, anybody told him more, anything more than one head is free? He didn't receive it. He would not receive that answer. Everybody said, wow. Comes back to our church. Now, I said, why don't you come to church over here? Oh. Okay. He goes over to the Foursquare Church. Now, the pastor was a good man. The pastor of that church was a really good man. Um, had a lot of appreciation and love for him. He's gone home to be with the Lord now, but he was a good man, good pastor, good four-square pastor. And um, so what is not going there, but, you know, um, why don't you, uh, you come over there? So within a year, they have gone in and somehow manipulated where he's taken over the church and the pastor steps down. And, you, you know, we didn't use this term back then. 
but it would work now. Shaking my head. How? You know what he does at that church? Blows it out of the water. <clears throat> that pastor had to come back in and take it back and get it to grow back up. They were standing in front of the congregation rebuking the pastor and all this stuff. And he, you know, I mean, it was just a mess. <clears throat> well, by and by, Buddy Harrison, I, we call him Buddy, but I always call him Brother Buddy. He comes to town because to, my pastor had become one of the regional directors for the FCF. And a lot of people don't realize this. The, the original FCF minister's blueprint of districts and regions, Buddy did. Rayma mimicked it, and which is fine. I mean, you know, you know Buddy, Buddy would, you know, he's Brother Hagin's son-in-law. You know, and so when they started RMI, they used that same construct to, to establish RMI. <coughs> <coughs> but Buddy's in town because my pastor is a regional director, and I'm ordained with Buddy. And now, this time, I'm now the executive aide in the church. I'm the pastor's aide. I take care of the guest speakers. I get to sit in the room with Lester Summerall and, um, you know, whoever's coming to the church, Buddy, Buddy and Pat, okay? Pick them up from the hotel and bring them to the church, that kind of stuff. And um, my former roommate, I'm outside the door because you can't go down that hallway. You got you, you to get past the pit bull if you think you're going down there. I being the pit bull. Okay. And I was not as heavy here. I was bigger here. And I was bigger here in those days. Okay. And had bigger legs. They weren't fat. They were big. I was, I was a weightlifter. Okay. Um, you know how that happens. It, it kind of just relocates. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, um, don't laugh about it. You better maybe be making your confessions now. That'll never happen to me in Jesus name. <laughs> um, so he comes to me and says, can I talk, can I talk to buddy? I said, I don't know. Let me go see. It's before service. And I go back there and I say, brother, buddy. I said, so-and-so is out there. And he goes, I told him, I told him. But he wouldn't listen. <laughs> so I'm like, whoa. <laughs> whoa. He said, yeah, let him come back here. So him and his wife, I'm leading them back there to him, and then I leave the room. And um, Buddy confided in me later. He told me, he said, I told them, move back to Tulsa. Because now at this point, they've blown two churches up. He's out of the ministry. <coughs> See, you cannot be in competition. I said this the other day. Jesus was not in competition. He did not minister in competition. He ministered out of compassion. You can't be in competition with somebody else. And they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. And we do it all the time. And there's the Bible telling you not to do it. Y'all hear you're going home. He said, I told him, pack up, move back to Tulsa, come back to the church, FCF North, the home church, <coughs> the whole FCF organization. But he pastored that church and traveled and <coughs> took care of the ministers and all this and did the meetings, but he, that, that was his home church. That was the home base. I was there at the very first service. 115 outside, and the air conditioning broke on the building. <laughs> and we still had a glorious time. The fire has fallen. I don't know if it was heavenly or Tulsa heat wave, but the fire fell. And um, so he came back. He said, and so stay in the church at least six months, and I can help save your ministry. He went back. Came he, and Buddy told me later, he said he stayed and came to church for about a month. And I never saw him again. He didn't do what he told him to do. Now here's the wisdom trying to guide you. 
but you, you're trying to keep up with this success narrative that those who through manipulation, through whatever, through actually God calls they're going to grow that, that quickly in ministry, or they manipulated it, they used techniques that got them there, they could actually be out of the will of God and have a big church. They've learned all the techniques. They've learned how to manipulate people. They've learned how to control people. They've learned how to build a system where they can't leave. Let me say something. Now, I never want people to leave. No pastor does. But I've come to the point, uh, I, somebody said this one time, I'm driving the bus. If you get off at the next stop, you get off. If somebody else gets on, they get on. And I, I, I thought, you know what? I'm driving the bus. I don't have to keep up with so-and-so. Well, why isn't your church as big as theirs? I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I can't go worry about or think about keeping up with them. And a lot of times in particular, I can't do it the way they're doing it because that ain't me. For me to do it like that would constrain me and keep me out of my gift and have me mimicking theirs. And I have to be faithful to what God told me to do. Well, I'm going to tell you, brother, you know, be careful. I've said things to people, you know. Well, you know, like when um, Janie had the um, cancer. She was dealing with cancer. We told the church, you know, we're going, we're going the route of surgery. That's what she wants to do. So I goes, well, I'll tell you one thing. I, I had something I believe God got healed. Great. We've prayed about it. And this is the place, the place where she's comfortable. So I'm not going to go, well, we just got to believe God. We had somebody in church do that, and they died. Our confession is no knife will ever touch his body. It didn't. He was dead. You try to talk to him. Nope. We believe no knife will ever touch his body. But, 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 but nope. Shut you down. Shut you down. Where are you? I really don't know. The spouse will come in. He's going to be a living, I tell the doctors, he's going to be a living testimony. You can't copy. You can't go. My experience is this. you got to follow my experience or you're not spiritual. Walking out the plan of God for your life. The blessings out there. God will, lead, so, you know, God will lead and guide you, as he did Abram. And in 24 years, he's, he's on this journey for 24 years. And then at, seven, at 99, all of a sudden, God shows up again with this major word. 24 years earlier it was, you're going to be the sand of the seashore, the stars of the heaven. I'll bless you, and, you know, and, and, um, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed. 99, next year you're going to have a baby. Wow. You could have told me that a few years ago. You could have gone ahead and just told me when it was. Then you walk by faith and not by sight. If God told you today the exact date, that it's like the, the major event of your life and, play, and purpose in the plan of God, and you had a date for it, you'd screw it up. In most cases. Now, on one hand, you might just go party hardy right up until the time you're supposed to get it right. Hello? Or you might try to figure out how to make it work and mess it up. There's all kinds of reasons. Hello? I used to confess every year, this is the year we're going into full-time ministry. And air, another year would come and go, and you're still slinging chickens. We caught slinging chickens because we, would, we popped, took the chicken out of the grease, we took the big baskets with four whole chickens in it, and pulled it up and rock it and go, whoosh, 
and then hang it on the hanger. Okay, so it could drain. Yeah. So we run down that hole 15 deep for our thing going, boom, boom, boom. The guy coming behind you with a pan going, dump, dump. Okay. I mean, we, we, we slung some yard buzzards. Now, back to, back to this, this roommate. He was called for full-time ministry. So his wife went out and worked 54 hours a week at a Taco Bueno. On her feet, nine months pregnant. While he prayed for the family. He stayed home and prayed for the family. If they had done that to Janie, you would need prayer. You wouldn't be praying. <laughs> okay? So now we have, was that, was that a bad side journey? The whole service was a side journey. Because we're reclaiming the blessing through words. So what does, now when he gets to 99, he gets very specific instructions and timetables. One, you will have a child next year at this time. Two, it's going to come through Sarah. And I heard you laugh. Three, we're changing your name. Why? Because he's going to access the blessing through words. He was changed from Abram to Abraham. Or Abraham. Meaning father of many nations. Or father of a multitude. Sarah was changed to Sarah. The feminine meaning being the mother of many nations. What's happening? Every time he, somebody says, what's your name? It's no longer Abram. I'm Abraham. I'm the father of many nations. I'm the father of many nations. He goes into the city gates, and there comes Abraham. Words are now engaged with the promise of next year. Amen. Amen. So now words are being released. See, it wasn't a worked up thing. Does that make sense? It wasn't this thing where he goes, well, I've got, uh, I'm going to be the best, greatest pastor on the planet. I confess that I'm the greatest pastor that ever lived. You can't do that. You can't do that. Where's your Bible for it? I can have what I say. But what you say in faith begins with the will of God is known. How do you know you're going to be the greatest? Actually, it smells like pride. <clears throat> it doesn't pass the smell test. Okay? We walk around, put some boxes there in the day, and Janie goes, there's a skunk out here. Daniel goes, yep. <laughs> I'm going, huh? <laughs> oh, oh, God, yeah, I got a whiff. God gave him a word and then gave him words to speak that coincided with what he told him. It wasn't made up. Abram didn't go, well, if I'm, if I'm going to have children this time next year, I'm, i got to confess that I'm the father of many. God changed his name. God put a word in his mouth, and he began to speak those words to tap into what God had promised. Anybody get anything out of this? And so now, Abraham's going around and saying, hey. And I almost went into one of them beach songs or one of them old songs. I'm trying to think of which one. Hit, hit. Oh, run around soon. Okay. I knew that little hit. hit, hit, hit. My memory brain's going, what, the, what was that? What was it? Oh, run around soon. Okay. Dion and the Belmonts. Okay. <clears throat> Love me some Dion. Then he got saved. <laughs> yeah, he got saved years ago. Did an album. Really cool album. Wasn't it, Bill? Really cool. I, I love that. That's a great couple. He had several, you know, 
uh, really good albums uh, as Christian, Christian albums because he got saved, got born again. Glory to God. You say amen. Um, but now he's speaking words. And God said this time next year. It's a year. So just three, at, after 24 years of nothing, three months of confessing a word that came from God about what was going to happen, just three months of confessing at that point, she's pregnant. Because a year later she had a baby. Y'all here? You see, there are times we try to make stuff happen before it's the time or the season. And we're trying to manipulate it by speaking words out of our head instead of out of our spirit. And I can guarantee you I've walked that path. And it doesn't work. You can Jericho march, holy oil, holy water, splash and dance all you want to. But if you don't have the word of the Lord on it, I'm, try I'm really trying to wrap up. I came in here so dog tired I couldn't hardly walk. And now, man, I'm like, <laughs> and Pastor Ed was long and preaching. Everybody stay out of the windows. We don't need for you to fall out and have to go raise you up from the dead. We were trying to buy a house. We, we, had bought our, we had bought our first home. No. Yeah, we had bought our first home, but it was time for us to move. We knew it was time for us to get something else. And uh, so we went and, you know, we actually looked at the house we're in now. And, uh, yeah, it didn't work out. It was too expensive. It was too expensive. And it was pretty, it was, you know, we actually got it like $35,000, dollars $40,000 less a year later when we did buy it. So we went over to this other neighborhood, um, and it was a, it was a, it was when they, they weren't spec houses, but they were you know it's the companies they build the same floor plan and different model you know they have a model shop and you go in there and you take the floor plan and you'll modify the, the the front and that kind of the elevation you know and all that kind of stuff and make it your own. We, we did that. We took this house. We added the porch onto the front. They didn't have a floor floor plan with that house with a, floor, a elevation with a front porch. They redrew the blueprints and put the porch on it. You know, had that porch on it. We did this. We had th they had this. They had all the stuff we had done really special. Our house wouldn't sell. I danced. I marched. I screamed. I bound. And nothing. We couldn't drag them into the house. I mean, I, I even thought about going out with a shotgun and say, you're going to come in here and buy this house. Because we kept running up on the date that you had to have your house under contract or they were going to put theirs back out as a spec house, which they did while we were in Europe, ministry. Came back home. They had turned it into a spec house. They changed all the stuff on the inside that we said we wanted. We had wanted white walls, white trim. I hate antique white. You may love it. I hate it. I detest antique white. It just looks dirty all the time to me. That's personal taste. You may think anti antique white isn't the best thing since sliced bread and peanut butter. But if it's sliced bread, it's whole wheat. <laughs> it's not white bread. All right? Antique white. I mean, antique white walls, antique white trim, which is just like dingy looking. Sprayed ceilings. We have the word flat. Sprayed the ceilings. We had um, like this colored countertop with this green tiled floor came in, white flooring, white cabinets, white countertop. I felt like I was in a Mr. Clean commercial. <laughs> so we went to the office the next day, because that was a Sunday. We went to the office the next day, went in there and said, what did you do? They said, well, you didn't have to say yes time. But we still want to sell it to you. I said, no, give me my earnest money back. We're out. We're out of contract. Give me my money back. I ain't buying that house. I don't want that house. You ruined it. Ruin. They just didn't ruin it. They ruined it. <laughs> so we went back to our house and said, forget it. We remodeled. When I say remodeled, we painted, we changed the colors, put up wallpaper, da 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 Okay? Put in new carpet. Three kids, new carpet. 
puke, pee, all kinds of stuff all over the carpet. It's time to get new carpet. Okay? It's just the way it is. You all, you all know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> we said, and we saw this house that we're in again. Well, in the meantime, they had painted that white brick. They, they had a speckled white natural brick just with white vinyl trim on the upper part, you know, on the, on the, on the um, dormers. They had done white trim on that because it's harder to put brick up. Well, they painted the whole house white, the brick white, and it, it looked like a completely different house. So we went in and looked at it. said, we want it. So well, you got to get your house under contract. It's under contract like less than a week. Now, I had Jericho march. I had bound the devil. I had screamed at the devil. I had thrown anointing oil. <coughs> I did everything on the planet you could think about doing. <coughs> and uh, we had to, we were trying to sell it this time. We were, it was semi-selling it ourselves, but Janelle was our realtor. As those of you know Janelle, she was our realtor. And I'd, I'd keep the, I'd print stuff and keep those little flyers in that little tube. And one day I looked out across the street, and this, this girl was sitting in her van just looking at it. And we were out of stuff in the tube. And when I said, are you interested in the house? She said, yes. I said, I'm, I, I, let me go print some stuff for you. And she sat there. When I came back and handed her, she said, I've been riding by this house for X number of years, dreaming that one day I could buy this house. She was from Rocky Mount, North Carolina. We had a big wraparound front porch with swings on it and all this stuff. And she it reminded her of an, it was a farmhouse style. That's what they call it. They call it the farmhouse style. That, she's from Eastern Carolina. That was in her blood. And she's just sitting there. She would ride by and dream that she could have that house one day. And she got it. Her and her husband bought it. Amen. And we went and bought our house. Everybody's happy. Except Jerry was helpless to move in during the hurricane. And moving in and finishing up as a hurricane was leaving. Isn't that right, Jerry? I mean, but we had a, we knew in our heart then it was ours. Now, I, I'm, I'm really going to wrap up here. I know we're going longer tonight, but I'm on a roll. And I'm almost done filling up both sides of a 90-minute cassette tape. Okay? And uh, Lord, just, just re refresh them. Let them be, what's that, Brother Bill? I got the ointment. The ointment's flowing tonight. And we got joy, joy, joy in our heart since Jesus said everything right. Said my old tattered garments gave me a robe up your white. Now we're feast feasting on manna from heaven. That's why I'm happy tonight. Feast on manna. All right. Because this is manna. When we bought the house, we went to the, we went to the closing, closing. The people got there. They were $1,500 short of what they needed at closing. They said, we could get it next week. And, and, and uh, the lawyer says, can we see it? Can I see y'all outside? We're like, this ain't good. She said, they don't have the money. And we're, we're left, she said, what are y'all going to do? We're like, give us a second. So we went in another room. She came back in. I said, can we loan them the money? She said, yeah. I said, I want you to write up a contract. We're going to loan them the $1,500, and they got to pay us back in 30 days. Now, they have to pay the fee that's what you're going to charge to write it. So she goes back in and presents it, comes back and says, of course they said yes. <laughs> they pay us back in two weeks. Okay? So that was the first debacle at closing. Then um, <laughs> we leave closing. That's all ha happening. We're moving in. Next morning, Janelle calls us. Past Janie. She's got Janie on the phone. Are you sitting down? Because we're moving out of the house. I'm driving a truck across town to move in. She's on the phone. And she said, they didn't fund the loan. They pulled a credit report after closing. The bank has refused to close the loan because she's got a bankruptcy on her, on her records. 
and they're just finding out now why. So Jane's saying, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to move in. At this point, we know it's our house. So we're moving in. It's my house. And I'm riding around that U-Haul. Just love U-Hauls. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Beating on the steering wheel. Devil, take your hand off my house. That's my house in Jesus' name. You can't take it. We sleep on the mattress on the floor. Hurricanes just blowing outside, winds blowing and howling. She's, you know, every, I mean, just it's a, it, you're, 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 you're having to stay in faith. I mean, the storms of life are being matched on the outside with a hurricane. Next morning at 10 o'clock, we get a phone call. It's all settled. They, um, she had the proof that she had paid that off and settled that, and they funded the loan. But I was able to scream and shout and stand in faith. Now, I had screamed and shouted and marched around my house to try to sell it before. I couldn't sell it. But now I knew I had, I knew it was right. The Lord put it in our heart. This is our house. It changed everything. I said it changed everything. Because he put it in our heart. This is yours. Before I wanted the other house, kind of. All right? It was going to be a nice house. It was going to be fine. Yeah, okay. We can, we, can, we can live here. We can do this. But it would never work. I don't care what I did. Janelle would hold open, Janelle would hold open houses to make us happy. Because she always said, it never works. You know, they don't work. You know, they just don't work. At least that, they, back then in that market. Okay. Now, in today's market, you could probably sell a, an outhouse. <laughs> you could have an open house and an outhouse and sell it. Y'all here going home? It just wouldn't work. But once we got the clear from God that, you know, this is the house, we had no problem selling ours. Not a bit. Now, the devil tried to be ugly and blow, huff and pluff and blow your house out last second. He couldn't do it. I was in faith. It was mine. I have it. It belongs to me. <clears throat> and I wasn't confessing what I'd heard before. It was coming out of my spirit. It wasn't coming out of here. There's a difference. Can y'all say amen? All right. Did y'all get anything out of that? I know it went long. Oh, well. We're, we're, listen, you know I don't try to preach long just to preach long anymore. I don't do that. But I'm not going to unhook from the Holy Ghost because the time said a certain time. Yeah, but Pastor, you went a long time. Yeah. I used to do that all the time. Isn't that right, Brother Bill? Huh? <laughs> and we really thought we had a humdinger when you had to take out the first master, 92 minutes, and put in another. Lord, we done gone into a second tape. And he's still going strong like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> and then I heard a word from the Lord or through somebody. The short-winded shall preach again. <laughs> now, I, can I tell you what really did it for me? Is Dr. Roy Hicks, uh, former general overseer of the Four Square Church International. Was, I was at a meeting. He was there. He's talking about this young minister. He said, I can't get my church to do this. I can't get my church to do that. He said, and he said, he said, son, how long do you preach? He said, an hour and a half. He looked at him, the stately older, you know, Pentecostal minister, sat and worked under Amy Simple McPherson, and goes, son, are you really that good? <laughs> and I went, probably not. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking to myself, oh, <laughs> are you really that good? So I started working on shortening them down. Even I think we even started buying 60-minute cassette masters. <laughs> you know, constrain me a little bit. But now we're back on where it's internet and it's, it's, it's unlimited. I can fill up a whole two-terabyte drive and keep going. 
All right. If you need an offering envelope, go ahead and grab it and sign up. If you're giving on, uh, exp uh, expeditiously. If you're giving, <laughs> I don't even know what word I was going to use. If you're giving online, uh, you can go ahead and get your electronics offers out and get those ready. Glory to God. Send those in. And follow Jesus' name. We bless the people as they tithe and give. Thank you that heaven's windows are open. And you pour out blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> amen. All right. Go ahead, Brother Joe. Now, if you're going to help us tomorrow, we will be meeting at the um, storage unit at 9 o'clock. Who's, who's helping? But you know you are. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody coming later? You? Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I, I could kind of help you use you to help sort through some of the electronics. We will have by by the time y'all y'all gonna get there what, after lunch. Yeah. By the time you get there, we should have all the stuff organized for you to look through, and uh, you know, saying that yeah, we want to keep this. Uh, we don't need to keep that. That kind of thing, and uh, get it completely organized. Then I can then then we can finish that those up and be out of the building and save our four hundred dollars nineteen four hundred nineteen dollars for next month, of which we spent right much of it moving. Yes, 89 cents a mile on that U-Haul, we put 160 miles on it in the past three days. But it had to be done. Listen, I'm like, okay, so I spent that money that w was going to go to the storage unit to move out of the storage unit this month, going into July, and that's it. There won't be any more money going there. I've already discontinued payments. That the one going out for July 1st ain't going out. I took it off a of bill. I, I deleted the whole thing on bill pay. They get no more money. It's over with. I feel like Boss Skaggs. It's over. It's over now. <laughs> Why can't you get it through your head? It's over. It's over now. <laughs> oh, boy. There's a new, fresh revitalization of the ointment coming on, Pastor. <laughs> Glory. Going back to the old days. Just give me that old time, Pastor. Give me that old time. Did you take out the offer? We love you. God bless you. See y'all 9 o'clock in the morning at the um, at AAA storage on Groomtown. If not, uh, have a wonderful day. If you're getting there later, we'll see you then. But I just want you to know, thank God for you. Thank God. And listen, there's not, you can't have 40, we can't have 45 people doing this. You know, there's organization to do. There's stacking stuff in stacks so that we can haul it off to different places and finish cleaning out. It's about 90%. 85%, 90% done, Daniel, you think? Between the two units together? <clears throat> we can put everything over there in half of one of the units right now or less. That's how much is not in there anymore. <laughs> like, I can just shut the doors, leave everything in there, and go and say, y'all do whatever you want to with it. <laughs> but we're, we're, some of our electronic stuff, we do want to get through it and just see what's in there and what we, what we, need, we do need to keep that kind of stuff. So I will have plastic tubs to organize. I'm going to buy some tomorrow, some boxes. It's just got to finish it up. And um, I've got a call out to one of my uh, coworkers, see if they want my desk. And uh, we will see if they want it. And he hasn't answered. All right? Y'all have a great night. Thank you for everything. Those who have lent your spouse, thank you. All right. Have a great night, everybody.